This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Studios of WKTV. Let's go inside for Silent Voices. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my purpose in being here today is just to engage in some public education and discussion about the issues that might be important to you. Um, I think as to parents who are accused of acts of abuse or neglect of a child or other circumstances that in which they provided an unfit place for a minor to live. I think the two most important, vitally uh, necessary uh, procedures they have to understand in order to uh, execute on their rights uh, is that they need to know they have a right to a jury trial in Michigan before the allegations against them are adjudicated or determined. That jury trial is a jury of six people, and five of those six agreeing on a verdict can enter a verdict that the court accepts. Uh, the second vitally important right that a parent needs to utilize at the phase where the allegations against you are being heard and throughout the rest of the trial up to and including uh, uh, termination of parental rights proceedings is the right to have the effective assistance of counsel. Now what that means among lawyers and judges is you have the right to an attorney who's well prepared uh, about the facts in your case, familiar with the documents, and fully participating uh, energetically and zealously representing your interests as a parent. Uh, in, uh, in my experience, and I'll briefly categorize that, my wife and I were foster parents for uh, 11 years and we had 17 different children in our home from periods ranging from a couple of days to over a year. Uh, my wife has a master's degree in social work and I've been a lawyer for 32 years. Uh, I was a lawyer and she was a social worker while we were foster parents. We adopted two of the children in our home. Uh, we advocated for the return of several of our foster children to their birth parents. And that happened in several cases because we were supervising visits between the birth parent and the, the children and recommended that uh, the dynamics of that visit were healthy and enjoyable and productive for the children and the parent's behavior was entirely appropriate. Uh, in at least one case I can remember, on the strength of our recommendation and input from the attorneys in the case, uh, two brothers who were in our foster home for over a year were returned to their father who then stumbled and became an even worse alcoholic than he had been previously and those children who were returned to their parents had a very difficult life and now one of them has a very substantial criminal record and great difficulty finding uh, a job and the other brother has a minor criminal record and difficulties with employment. So that was a return to the parent that frankly didn't really work well for those kids. And that's one of my regrets being in the foster care system. Uh, I developed a practice representing foster parents in complaints against them. And I represented adoptive parents and family members who were denied an opportunity to adopt children in their, into their homes from their own family a preference being given to foster parents or uh, unacquainted strangers picked out of a registry of applicants for adoption. I've done section 45 motions, a number of them. Uh, lost 80 percent of them because the standard is unrealistically high. What you have to prove to upset a DHS uh, determination choosing a foster parent is uh, unrealistically high in my opinion. Maybe you'd look into that issue and study that. Uh, one of the big surprises I've had since I got on the bench is observing how few people exercise their right to a jury trial. 
since I got on the bench in my county, going back, I would say 15 years, there have been fewer than 10 jury trials in 15 years. Uh, I haven't had a one, and I'm ready to have one anytime somebody wants to demand it. And they don't have to explain why they want it. They've got the unquestioned right to have a jury trial. Uh, the experience in our county is nobody wants a jury trial. They don't want to put the allegations against them to the test in front of a jury of six parents or six faithful citizens. And I'm mystified. I'm flabbergasted that that's the truth. Most people waive their right to a jury trial. A good many of the people I met in the child welfare system never came to an understanding that they had the right to a jury trial. I don't know how they escape that if they had court-appointed counsel or retained counsel. Uh, the other uh, thing about exercising your right to counsel, it's unquestioned if you're indigent that you have the right to court-appointed counsel at low or no expense to you. But the big question is, after you've gotten a court-appointed counsel, is he really going to go to bat for you? That's his legal, ethical obligation. There's no question about that. And there's no question about uh, your entitlement to an attorney if you're indigent. But each, the, Michigan has no uniform standard for indigency. Indigency can mean one thing in Detroit, an entirely different thing in Oakland County, an entirely different thing in all 83 counties. And indeed it does, there's no pattern. In our county, we've been talking about the indigency standard. I did some research and proposed that we revise it. We update it. It had not been touched, our monetary figure for below this level you get an attorney at court cost, above this level you have to hire your own attorney or represent yourself. We had not revised that dollar figure in over 20 years. We, we, the judges, and I've only been on the bench for three and a half years, had never had a discussion in 20 years about revising it. Uh, I suggested that we have a standard that said, instead of our current standard of uh, net income of $300 per week, below that at $299, you got a court-appointed attorney. At $301, you were expected to get your own attorney and pay him. Uh, I think that's a completely ridiculous standard. I wanted to ratchet that up to 400, which I thought was not adequate yet, but better than 300, and say, we'll add to that $400 figure $75 per dependent in your family. So if you have five dependents, you're gonna add, what is that, $375? So you'll get an attorney if you make less than 375 plus 400 a month. Most of the attorneys who are doing court-appointed counsel work are uh, doing so because they want to keep their office open, pay the light bill and the rent bill, and it doesn't pay any decent amount of money. I did that kind of work for over 10 years and did it in 23 counties. And I made doing that kind of work about 20% of what I made doing the same kinds of work in the same courts on the same issues and being privately retained and paid. So there's a serious problem with the health of the court appointed counsel system that they are so radically and substantially underpaid that as a practical matter, if they try a jury trial case and it takes them three or four days, they are losing money every moment they're in the courtroom. And that works to their financial disadvantage. Put it another way, it gives them a practical business inducement, I'm afraid, to try and look for resolutions of a case that don't involve a trial, or at least not a jury trial. And I think that's unfortunate. There's a report out recently about the court-appointed counsel system by retired Judge Fisher of Barry County. It's on a governor's commission. But you can look through the hist recent history of Michigan, the last 10 years, and find at least three detailed, elaborate studies, one done by the State Bar in cooperation with uh, the American Bar Association. You can read the ABA's standards on quality representation for uh, children. These reports are out there. They've been out there. They're all collecting dust because nobody really puts those into effect. And the reason I suspect that they're not put into effect is that there isn't the money 
to commit to make those systems healthy and to keep training for lawyers who are doing those things current and to keep their caseloads down. And those are the conclusions, some of them, from most recent uh, report judge, done by retired Judge Fisher. Take a look at that report. Look at the indigency standards in your county. Go to these proceedings and watch what happens in court. And if you get the opportunity to see a case where there are two or three court-appointed attorneys and one or two retained attorneys making four to six times the amount of money, see if you can detect any difference in the quality of representation there. That would be an interesting experience for you. Other things I want to address very briefly. Uh, hearsay testimony is as you might know from watching TV uh, legal dramas, not generally admissible. There are, however, dozens of exceptions to the hearsay rule that let hearsay in. But each of those hearsay exceptions is kind of detailed, and you have to fit the exception to get it in. Uh, in many different kinds of hearings, I've tossed a lot of hearsay testimony, stricken the answers, refused to let the witness answer those questions that solicit the witness to make a hearsay statement. But in termination of parental rights cases, hearsay is admissible in Michigan. There's no reason hearsay has got to be admissible. It's not a constitutional doctrine. If the legislature decided tomorrow to ban hearsay and say all evidence in a termination of parental rights case ought to be admissible evidence subject to exclusion under the hearsay rule, the legislature could do that in the New York minute if the governor had signed it. I think somebody, a group like yours, ought to discuss that and consider advocating for that change. Our current standard for terminating parental rights is proof that's clear and convincing is necessary. Clear and convincing evidence that the parent is unfit, clear and convincing evidence that the factual basis for that conclusion is proven, clear and convincing evidence to demonstrate that the parent can't or won't improve or hasn't made the effort to do so. You know, for an Indian child, removed from an Indian family and they want to terminate the parental rights of the Indian family, uh, if that child is not only a member of the, an Indian tribe but even eligible to become a member of an Indian tribe, the standard to terminate the parental rights of that Indian child is evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. Why isn't that the same high standard that is used for Afro-American children's termination of parental rights or Caucasian children? Uh, uh, Hispanic children, I don't, I don't get it. I just frankly don't get it, and I've read hundreds of cases. There is a rationale out there, but it's unacceptably confused and weak to me. So you could consider, discuss, and reach your legislatures about changing the standard of proof for termination of parental rights. Uh, I think it ought to be beyond a reasonable doubt. The public's familiar with that. Anybody called to jury service in a criminal case has heard the instruction about what the standard beyond a reasonable doubt means. I think the, the public could be familiar with that. Uh, and finally, I guess I encourage you all in your respective counties to get heavily involved in election campaigns for circuit court judge, for probate court judge, and for chief prosecutor because those are the key officials in every county who have their lever, their hands on some of the levers that move the child welfare system forward. And it's necessary that we have a child welfare system that can move forward. Because while people in this audience, and I've heard a couple of the presentations, have had what sound like horrific experiences with the child welfare system, there really are parents out there who are dangerous and damaging and injurious and crazy and unfit to be parents. And there has to be some system like this that is functional to save those children from a lifetime of abject misery and injury and death. And if you doubt that, go to your county prosecutor and say, I would like you to identify for me the last four cases in which a child suffered brain damage or death from physical abuse or neglect. Go to the county clerk, pull that file, and you'll be able to read all the non-confidential parts of that file. See if you don't agree with me, because I've been at the table when those kinds of cases are tried, and it's enough to make you sick. Beyond disappointed, but sick about what some children have suffered. And yes, I agree with you, there are children who have suffered at the hands of foster parents who 
went off the deep end and there are children who have suffered at the hands of uh, uh, overzealous prosecutors and unprepared defense attorneys and there's everybody in the child welfare system makes serious mistakes. The one that rings out with me was uh, in Ray MK I think was the title of the case a little child was born with uh, birth defects and who had a tremendous struggle to maintain his or her life there was a hearing on a neglect abuse petition against the parents before a referee he issued an order allowing a doctor to pull the plug on that child and let the child die he specifically said don't take any action like this until seven days has gone by and the circuit court judge can cons reconsider this decision. Well, he gave his order to the DHS people according to this Michigan Supreme Court case. The, the uh, DSS workers that appeared from that case gave the order to the doctor and said you can pull the plug. They did. The child died. And the child was not represented in that proceeding by the same attorney who had studied all the medical records, understand, understood the child's condition, and felt that the child should be given an opportunity to live. So read that if you have any doubts about uh, poor performance in the child welfare system costing children uh, their lives and why the Supreme, ask yourself the question, do you think the Supreme Court handled that case appropriately, that they took the correct uh, measures to see that that kind of a case would never happen again? Uh, I invite you to make your own judgment on that. Uh, so if you get involved in campaigns for county prosecutor, probate judge, circuit judge, you'll be doing yourself a favor. You'll be doing every child in your county a favor. You'll be doing every parent in your jurisdiction a favor. Maybe you want to come up here and take the mic, and I'll stand here. Or no. um, So I, I read the um, report by Judge Fisher about the indigency. indigency. Uh -huh. um, I couldn't make that because my mom was passing away and I was taking care of her, um, and I wanted to make those meetings, and I couldn't. Um, I also did some research into the funding um, for the courts and found billions upon billions of dollars. I was actually amazed on how much money there was. There is um, a jury fund and there is so much money in that that they're now taking money from that and putting it back into the court system. What I find from talking about people is that um, they don't take a jury um, trial because they're told that if they go to court they're looking up to 10 years in jail or you could plea bargain and get two years probation. Would you want 10 years in jail if you should go into a jury and you lose or would you take two years of probation? I'd take two years of probation. But now that I know how the system works, I wouldn't and I'd go to a jury trial. But there's so much people that heard about corruption that's going on in the court system and um, we don't trust our attorneys. I got divorced. It cost me $20,000 to an attorney that lied and manipulated me. I refuse to hire an attorney and I'll represent myself. I can spend $20,000 and lose or I can not spend any money, learn what I'm doing and do it myself. And that's what I would prefer to do. Okay. Well, I, I res respect your assertion of the right to represent yourself. I think you've got that right. Whether that's the strategically start, uh, right and correct and advisable move is really doubtful to me because uh, if you're tenacious, if you're willing to spend the time and do the study when you're representing yourself, you may make it through the system successfully. But if you don't spend the time, uh, you're going to botch that job and it's going to cost you. And that's the same if you were doing a, a piece of electrical rehabilitation work or plumbing at your house. Uh, but there was some confusion in your earlier remarks. Uh, in a neglect abuse case, that's a civil case. It's not a criminal case. A judge can't send you to jail for not following the case services plan. He can send you for contempt, but judges rarely exercise that authority unless somebody stands up in the courtroom and says, you know, you're an XYZ expletive. Uh, I've never known that to happen. Uh, the criminal things about take 10 years in, of a penalty or two years of probation, those are offers in a criminal case. There are criminal child abuse charges where that could be the range offered to you but there are two different tracks one civil and one criminal and that's why you have lesser civil standards of 
uh, preponderance of the evidence and clear and convincing to terminate instead of beyond a reasonable doubt in a criminal proceeding. Actually, parents would be much better if they moved the neglect abuse field, including uh, termination of parental rights into the criminal justice system, because it's that important to my mind. But ask yourself this question. In a criminal case with a felony, you get 12 jurors, and they have to be unanimous, which means that verdict from that jury has to represent the individual considered judgment of each one of those 12 jurors. In a termination of parental rights case, it's six jurors, and five out of the six can make the determination. Why do we require 12 unanimous jurors for a circuit judge to send someone to jail or prison, but we only require five out of six jurors to have someone's children taken away from them forever. I don't see that as the correct balance. My personal opinion, you examine the issues and advocate as you see fit. Sir. I introduced myself to you earlier, but you may not have heard me. Bill Windsor, I'm there. I haven't heard of you, Bill. Bill Windsor. Nice to see you. Um, I've got a couple of questions for you. I took some notes on what you said. Uh, this is one that isn't refer to what you said. Do you believe that women lie about abuse? I think some women lie about some abuse. Some men lie about some abuse. There's no generalization on that subject that's meaningful because People will lie about any subject under the right circumstances if they have that character deficiency. It seems to me from all the people I've interviewed all across the country that judges, perhaps you're an exception, seem to think that women lie about abuse. Uh, I don't see it happening with men, it happens with women, so it seems to be an issue. You said that... Uh, well, men will have lied about abuse and will lie in the denial of abuse. Exactly. It's, it's equally great. If 52 women had their parental rights terminated by Judge Patricia Gardner, does that sound like perhaps Judge Patricia Gardner might have a problem with women? Why should any woman be denied their parental rights? Why should any grandparent be denied their parental rights? If they have never done anything abusive, have never committed a crime other than one manufactured by a judge? Well, uh, the fact that you haven't committed a crime uh, doesn't free you from responsibility to treat your children in a non-neglectful, non-abusive way. Uh, you still have that obligation. Your child is entitled to that. And that's not asking too much on behalf of a child. Uh, so we have two tracks of a system. We have a criminal justice system that assesses who's criminally responsible and who can be pr punished with jail and probation and prison sentences and fines and costs. And we have a separate civil proceeding for terminating parental rights and adjudicating who's guilty of child abuse and neglect. Those systems could be merged. It's something that ought to be carefully considered. They never have been emerged, and I don't know of a single state in the union that does merge those. But if you adopted the same standard for termination of parental rights, evidence beyond a reasonable doubt, that wouldn't offend my sensibilities or legal uh, judgments at all. That's all I can tell you. And about uh, uh, Judge Gardner, uh, I've been in her, uh, in her courtroom. Uh, I've never had a, a client in front of her. Uh, if I did and I had something critical to say about her, I can tell you two things that would be absolutely certain. I wouldn't discuss it in public because then I'd be fearful of what would happen to me the next time I'm in that courtroom. And I would discuss it, I would discuss it with uh, with the Judicial Tenure Commission if it was a matter of ethics and I would discuss it with a federal district court judge if I thought civil rights were impaired and I most certainly would discuss it with the Michigan Court of Appeals and then the Michigan Supreme Court after that if I thought there was something erroneous about the ruling and the conduct and the evidence but if you don't exercise your right to zealous effective representation of counsel before any judge and if you don't know your rights as to a jury trial and so forth 
you're not a well-informed parent. And a well-informed parent is in a better position to protect their rights and protect their children than any other kind of a parent. Uh, the Court of Appeals and the, and the Supreme Court have the option, you might even say the responsibility, to upset any trial court judge's decision if they get a timely appeal. And people don't appeal like they don't file jury demands in counties I'm familiar with. And that's all I can say. We'll try to educate them on it. I have one more question. Uh, I, I, res yeah. I respect you for answering. Uh, you said, this is quoting you, you said there are dangerous people and there has to be clear and convincing evidence that a parent is unfit. If, yeah, it, or if for custody, I guess, uh, uh, or visitation, you have to take all that in consideration, right? No, it's a preponderance of the evidence to get jurisdiction. Right. Well, if a woman has her back broken for of the vertebrae in her neck crushed, she has a heart attack and dies. And this is all the result of what her loving ex-husband did. You're moving into that disputed matter that's in front of me, so I can't respond. But you have the floor, you have the microphone. You can say anything you want. You well, sir, I, 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 don't mean to be, I don't mean to be rude, but in my well, opinion. You are rude. I got up there not wanting to confront you or her because it's unethical for a judge to take on a litigant in a case mm -hmm. in public. It's not a fair fight, All right. and I'm not going to respond to it. Well, just let me let you know, you're going to be a star in Lawless America the movie. You're invited to give me a, uh, an interview at any time. I am going to expose you for being what I think is a criminal. I think you have no business being here. No, Bernie, go ahead. I'll take it. Come here. All right. Well, that's, uh, thank you, Judge Cronin, for coming. Um, very interesting exchange here. I wanted to just make a couple comments uh, on, on three things that Judge Cronin pointed out. Uh, one was standard of proof, raise the standard of proof, proof for removal. Okay, he said that wouldn't bother him at all. Okay. And that's one of our legislative goals. Another item that Judge Cronin mentioned is indigent defense. Uh, Court-appointed attorneys is the system we have now. Uh, Governor Rick Snyder uh, presented a report to the legislature this past week. He knows there's a problem and something that needs to be looked at. All right. A third thing that Judge Cronin mentioned is jury trial. One. Did he say one in the last 15 years in family court, not criminal cases, but family cases, uh, only one. And so he's saying you need to know that you have a right to a jury trial.